the hope that the war would end when the Red Army, aided by the Allied Air Force, defeated Germany died when politicians decided to insist on its unconditional surrender. For Hitler's gang, this war became a war to the end. In angry messages, Stalin demanded that an invasion be launched to relieve the pressure on the Eastern Front, where the fanatical Germans, slowly retreating, were inflicting the heaviest blows on the Russian army. By March 1944, the Allied invasion plan was almost complete. All that was needed was the final concentration of troops and equipment and good weather. Our air attacks in occupied Europe and Germany, continued with heavy emphasis on the communications and transportation system, were aimed at destroying the German defence system before the Allies landed. As D-Day approached, the work at Second Air Group headquarters increased significantly, and I had to reduce my number of combat sorties. To increase the effectiveness of night assault attacks, squadrons were developed new and more effective methods. Previous attacks on airfields in northern France had shown that crews could find the target, but shooting and bombing from low altitudes in the dark were usually of little effect. Crews had to concentrate on not crashing into the ground, because when they dive-bombed their targets, they had no visible landmark to control altitude. Among the mass of thoughts about this problem at headquarters and in the squadrons was a proposal to use 114 mm flares on parachutes. The idea was that as soon as a Mossy reached the target area or detected the movement of the dim lights of a German army vehicle, the crew would fire one of these rockets. In dropped from an altitude of 900 to 1200 meters, the rocket, smoothly descending to the ground, burned for about two minutes, illuminating the surrounding area all this time. The Mossy crew could now see the target clearly and had time to make one or sometimes two successful attacks before the rocket went out. The group was stocked with a supply of these flares and holders to hang them from, and they were soon being used to great effect. Later this pyrotechnics was dropped in series to increase the illumination. At the end of March and in April I made four more daylight raids behind enemy lines and took part in a daylight low-altitude bombardment of the mapped Gascourt railroad station on the scene west of Paris. I made three daylight raids with sticks and one with the group navigator, squadron leader Robertson. During the bombing sorties I also flew with Robertsoy. Daytime raids into the enemy rear increased the number of enemy planes I destroyed to 27. In two of these sorties, one with Sticks and one with Robbie, we scored two victories each, both over Denmark. The raid on the important railroad station mapped Gascour was my first experience of low-altitude bombing. Being a novice in this business, I flew at the tail of a squadron of 13 Mossies, which attacked the target in pairs at intervals of a few minutes. By the time Robbie and I reached the target, the anti-aircraft artillery had really stirred and I had no doubt that the nice old Huns were very angry. This was the first time I'd seen them use the heavy 88 Nam anti-aircraft guns for strafing to shoot us down. The artillerymen fired almost horizontally as we flew over the very ground. The fact that shells were exploding near French houses didn't seem to bother them. Except for the anti-aircraft artillery, our sortie went smoothly. Our bombs had delayed fuses but we could not hang around to see them explode. We hastily left the area of anti-aircraft fire and were very happy to be unharmed. Most of the other crews taking part in the raid faced little opposition because they made full use of the surprise factor. It was on no. 13 that the enemy poured all his wrath. It's worth telling you about one of the victories during the afternoon raids mentioned above, because it made me subconsciously become overconfident. In fact, it was the one that was probably indirectly responsible for my subsequent defeat. As I began my daylight raids, I was convinced that it was necessary, but possible, to avoid encounters with single-seat fighters because of their superiority over the mosquitoes and because they usually operated in pairs or large groups. That time we were cruising near Poitiers, looking for trouble on our own heads. We spotted a German truck on a country road and prepared to attack it, as we moved into a gentle dive, Sticks drew my attention to a single plane 1.5 km ahead that was closing in on us. This was the best prey. We came out of the dive, now ignoring the German vehicle and watching the approaching airplane. At first I thought it was an American Thunderbolt. These fighters also operated deep in enemy territory, but usually in large groups. This plane was alone. I had no opportunity to quickly maneuver to get into a better position. Then I realized it was a Fockel 190 with an outboard tank. What to do? Withdraw or engage? I reckoned I couldn't get away from him. My mouth was dry with excitement, and I decided that the only way out was to fight. 
The German spotted me at the same moment I spotted him. He began a steep turn to tail me. Styx and I knew that if he succeeded in doing this, we would be finished. Abruptly taking the helm, I realized I could prevent him from catching our mossy in his sights. Then I remembered that, with the engine radiator flaps open, my turning radius decreases. For a few seconds that seemed a lifetime, he pursued me on increasingly steep turns. My speed dropped from 450 to 370 kilometers per hour. It was time to put an end to it. I opened the radiator flaps and found that we were starting to get ahead of him on the bends. Gradually, at just over 320 car, I came out to tail him. He realized the danger and suddenly came out of the turn, performing a semi-sideways turn and headed south over the ground at full speed. We outmaneuvered him. With the throttle sectors fully open, we quickly reached a speed of 480 clectophy, and being behind and above him, we wondered what if we tried to attack him ourselves. Styx was worried that we had little fuel left, but the hell with it, we couldn't let the fucky wolf get away, at least not without shelling him. We were flying right over the trees and houses, but I could see that we were slowly, very slowly approaching him. I realized that if we finished him off in the next few minutes, our gas would run out before we reached home. From a range of 540 meters, I caught the departing fuck wolf in my sights and fired a short burst. Hissed. I could see the fountains of earth raised by my shells as they hit the ground behind its tail. Damn it, I'd have to get closer. Despite Styx's warnings, I was now determined to shoot this fighter down, regardless of the price to be paid for it. Perhaps the enemy thought he could get away from us. He made no evasive fire maneuvers. From 360 meters, I fired a second and much longer line. There was a flash of flame as our shells hit his outboard tank. His left plane flew off and burning. He flipped over a wing and crashed into a tree, breaking into pieces that scattered across the field. As we swept over the scene of the crash, one of the wheels of his landing gear, thrown high by the force of the explosion, sailed through the air beside our mossy. Triumphant, we turned for home, feeding our mossy with the last drops of fuel. We landed at Ford with virtually empty tanks. We had defeated the vaunted Fucky Wharf 190, and that thought dominated my brain at that moment. The obvious fact that the enemy pilot was an inexperienced novice, I did not take into account at the time. Later I had plenty of time to realize this. I flew many of these daytime raids with planes from the 305th Polish Squadron, commanded by Ewing Komipta Kapoyaksek. One wing of this squadron was entirely Polish and the other partly British and was led by New Zealander squadron leader Mike Herrick, three flying with Styx or Robbie. I was able to score a few victories with her airplanes. The Poles celebrated our successes with an impromptu party and presented me with a beautiful silver, enamel-covered squadron emblem, making me an honorary member. I proudly keep that badge and certificate, numbered 809. My HQ work and flying left little time for visits to Joan in Leicester. When I did manage to spend a day or two there, it always seemed that I wanted to rush back to my comrades in the war. The longer the war went on, the stronger became my desire to take an active part in it. Even though my stay at home rarely exceeded 48 hours, I regret to admit that my small children and minor domestic problems annoyed me, often leading to heated arguments. They mostly concerned parenting. My views on it often clashed with those of my long-suffering father-in-law and mother-in-law, with poor Joan tossing herself between us, trying to reconcile. Fortunately for me, she was full of understanding and knew me better than I knew myself. Then she could not convince me that the cause of my irritability and unreasonable behavior was fatigue. But it was fatigue that in some perverse way made me steadily take foolish and unnecessary risks in a mad desire to get at the enemy again and again. During one of my visits, Joan showed me an article in a Leicester newspaper which stated that Johnny Johnsony, I had achieved a tally of 27 victories each, and that we were the two best fighter aces in England actively engaged in combat, as I myself thought that Johnny was the best. It was amusing, especially after being told that the local factory workers were even betting on which of us would come out the winner in the end. The fact that Johnson was from nearby Melton Mowbray, and Lister was my second home, played a big part in this. The very idea of a public competition for leadership amongst the fighter aces was nonsense. I couldn't compete with Johnson, even if I wanted to. Our roles were completely different. He was one of the most remarkable day fighter wing commanders of all time. With his Canadian Spitfires, he scouted out enemy Focky Wolves, 190s and Messerschmitt 109s and gained air superiority over his area of operations. 
In addition to being more experienced, he was also a more successful pilot personally. I, on the other hand, achieved my successes largely at night and only recently during the day. My job, along with the various radio operators and navigators, was mainly to hunt the lone wolf and to panic the Huns wherever we could find them. I apologize to those carefree punters in Leicester who bet on me and lost. However, for what it's worth, it was very flattering to me. After raids over France and Denmark, I decided that a more favorable hunting ground was Denmark after all. The long flights over the sea made serious demands on navigation, but the rewards were also large and varied. There was also less likelihood that we would be detected when crossing the Danish coast, as it had weak defenses. There were many Luftwaffe squadrons based in Denmark and Norway, on rest and replenishment after fighting in the east or west, as well as several training units. All of them were perfect game for us. I was also thinking of Norway as a future hunting ground. During May 1944, I was only able to fly two sorties, both over Denmark. One was flown with sticks and the other with Flight Lieutenant Don Walsh, a navigator on our staff. He had recently completed a successful tour in Group 2 on the Mitchells, like Robbie. He had heard great things about my raids and asked me to take him on one. Styx couldn't always fly with me without risking disruption, and so didn't mind when I occasionally took another navigator. During our first flight together, Don and I had good luck. West of Copenhagen, near the town of Roskilde, with a beautiful cathedral, we shot down a Junkers 88. It seemed that the flight would be fruitless. We found nothing. But just after we turned for home, Don spotted the plane flying under the clouds a few hundred meters above. We approached it stealthily, flying at low altitude over the flowery Danish countryside until the last minute. Then, at maximum speed, we began to gain altitude with a turn to tail him. The crew of the 88 must have seen us and headed for the protection of the nearest cloud. When the plane was already partially hidden in it, I fired a line from a distance of almost 800 meters, hoping that I would hit it before it dissolved. I missed. Fortunately for us, the cloud cover was not too thick, and it was not too difficult to follow him as we got closer. His tail gunner was desperately firing long bursts at us, but his firing was rash and caused no real concern. The distance was rapidly closing, and I gave three short bursts, firing whenever he appeared in a break in the clouds. After the last line debris flew from the airplane, but the next moment it disappeared into the cloud, and for a moment we thought it was gone. Suddenly we could see it clearly again. It crashed into the ground and exploded near the wall of the farmhouse. Don was now fully convinced that the day raids were the real game, but we could not have known then that we would only fly together one more time and that the end of this sortie would be a POW camp in Germany. While I was hanging around over Europe on my Mossy, the work of the group's night operations headquarters fell largely to Rufus Raisley. He was forbidden to fly over enemy territory because he had already been shot down once over France. With the help of the French resistance, he escaped capture and made his way back to England with a great deal of chain of custody information about the positions of the Far One. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Order for Bravery and Skill in Enemy Territory. He was disappointed that he could no longer fly himself, but never objected to my frequent absences. When I was back at my desk, there was always plenty to do. The use of flares on the mosses had improved the group's night assault capability, but there were still serious limitations. Aircraft could carry only a few rockets, and many targets of special interest on roads and railroads were only partially destroyed or damaged because the rockets went out before the crews could deliver the decisive blow. Since the main task of the second air group on, and after D-Day, was to isolate the battle area at night, something had to be done to increase the effectiveness of our assaults. Prior to this, four squadrons of Mitchells had been engaged only in daylight bombing from medium altitudes. These airplanes were destroyed many positions of FAL-1. Why not use Mitchells with their remarkable payload as Patfinder for our Mosquito? After much discussion, this proposal was accepted by the command. It was decided to send a single Mitchell, which was to patrol at an altitude of between 900 and 1500 meters over areas of France, in which several Mosquito were searching. When the Mosquito crew would spot what they thought was a suitable target, they would call in the Mitchell and direct the Pathfinder to the desired position. The very accurate electronic navigation system used on both the Mitchell and the Mosquito ensured that the target was located. The Mosquitoes flew in a circle, waiting for the Mitchell to appear which began dropping flares at regular intervals. 
These would illuminate the surrounding area until the Mossy crew destroyed the target or exhausted all bombs and all ammunition. The idea of using the Mitchells in a new role was expected to meet with some resistance. The crew's performance was really not very spectacular, since they did not directly strike the enemy. In addition, there was considerable risk involved. The Mitchell was inferior to the Mosquito in its flying characteristics and was vulnerable to attack by enemy night fighters. To instill in the Mitchell crews the importance of their work, members of the air group headquarters visited each of these squadrons and conducted briefings, giving details of their new role and advice on German night fighter tactics. It was obvious that the crews were disappointed. And this was understandable. They had performed many daytime sorties perfectly. In general, however, they took the new task quite favourably. But one of the squadrons, almost entirely composed of Dutch, very sharply defended its point of view. The results of combat performance of this squadron were excellent, and like most of our European allies who fought for the liberation of their countries, the Dutch hated the enemy even more than we do. Since they would not kill the enemy themselves in future sorties, they considered them a waste of time. One day, as Styx and I were briefing, they began to openly express their displeasure at us. They seemed to think that we were solely responsible for being chosen for this unpopular task. Their behaviour enraged me and some harsh words were exchanged between me and the commander of the brave Dutch squadron. Later in the day we cooled down a bit and parted, using friendly language judiciously. It was fate that two Mitchells were lost on one of our first night sorties, both from the Dutch squadron. Even worse was the fact that our intelligence confirmed that they had both been shot down by a Royal Air Force night fighter. It was a tragic mistake in identification. The night fighter had mistaken the Mitchells for rather similar Dornier bombers. The air group commander was very insistent that I get his approval for each of my raids, and I always obeyed his wishes. Styx and I planned to fly out to Denmark on May 12, 1944, and in the evening in the bar of the officers' mess hall I approached Embry for prior permission. Perhaps I should have picked a better moment. He was obviously in a bad mood because of some things going wrong. His answer was rather short, but he said he would think about it. This evasive remark was disappointing because Styx and I believed that our venture would prove very successful. The next morning I sent an execute command to the 107th Squadron at Lesham to have them prepare one of their mosses and went to see the boss again. But when I saw Meg, his personal assistant from the Women's Auxiliary, she said he was still out of sorts, and I decided not to go in to see him. As I walked pensively back from his office, I foolishly convinced myself that since he hadn't said an emphatic, things would end well for us if we flew. I didn't worry about it anymore. In the afternoon of May 11, Styx and I flew to Lesham in a liaison Oxford. Our mosquito was waiting for us. There were no recall messages from HQ, so we, thinking happily that all must be well, flew to West Raham to refuel there and set off early the next morning for the raid. Shortly after breakfast, we were airborne and crossing the North Sea, covering a distance of about 480 kilometres on our way to Denmark. Any worries about not having my old man's full approval faded into the background as we concentrated on flying and navigating. When the coast of Jutland showed, I took the helm a little to fly over the sand dunes, then we dropped back down to shaving height again, heading towards Aalborg, where there were a couple of German airfields. The weather began to deteriorate rapidly, and the clouds were almost at ground level, so we decided to leave Aalborg and turn to other airfields near Copenhagen. We seemed to have the surprise factor, but as we were flying over Kattegate a little north of Samso Island, we were fired upon from a small fishing boat, which I think was Danish. The machine gun fire was inaccurate, but it was now obvious that the alarm from it would be relayed to the Luftwaffe. However, there was the cloud cover we needed ahead, so we continued on our way to Copenhagen. There we found no sign of the enemy in the air and, turning west, headed for home. Crossing the coast of Jutland near Aarhus, we were alarmed to see that the weather was beginning to improve rapidly. We were to be lucky if there were soon to be any clouds at all in which we could take shelter. I warned Styx to watch for enemy fighters behind us, and we continued on our way, flying as low as I dared at 420 kilometers per hour. People on the ground would fall to their knees in terror when we suddenly appeared seemingly out of nowhere and roared a few meters above their heads. We were sorry to frighten them, but this tactic gave us the best chance of survival. Midway across Jutland near Herning, Styx spotted a Focke 191.5 kilometers ahead and above us. I thought he couldn't see us, so I maneuvered to tail him. 
but he saw us well and diving towards the ground, headed north at maximum speed. It was a trick we believed. I flew after him. Sticks shouted, warning. Attention. Another creep is coming in from the left. I saw a Messerschmitt 109 dive at us from behind a small clump of clouds. From a distance of between 270 and 180 meters, he fired a long line. We turned toward him to make it difficult for him to fire. There was an ominous rumble as some of his shells hit us. A Messerschmitt flew close above us and went into a rapidly dissipating cloud. I thought he was coming in for another attack, and for a moment I forgot about the treacherous Focke Wolf 190. The Messerschmitt was no longer visible. He had either lost us when he went up into the cloud, or he had used up all his ammunition. A quick check of our plane showed no serious damage, and I could still see a second Focke, wall a mile and a half or so away, heading off in the direction of Alborg. I sticks, we've got to get him, I said and turned our plane around at top speed behind him. Geez, Bob, let's stop this and turn away now. We'll probably fall into another trap. This advice I ignored. I was determined to catch up with the Focke Wolf 190. My enemy was flying as low as we were, which made attacking from below impossible. Gradually, we descended lower and lower to the ground, and I squeezed everything out of the mossy that he was capable of, from a distance of 540 meters, being exactly behind. I opened fire, but my shells hit the ground a little behind his tail. A second later, we were caught in the swirling air current from its propeller, and the mosquito began to toss dangerously from side to side. We felt a faint thud. Jesus, Bob, we almost hit the ground. The tension in our airplane had reached an extraordinary level. Both of us were drenched in sweat, but at the same time we continued to get closer to him. Near Aelborg, over a narrow strip of water limb fjord, which separates the northern tip of Jutland from the rest of the peninsula, Fock went into a steep climb. We followed it, firing a short line from a distance of several hundred meters. In the tail part of the enemy fuselage were seen several flashes, flew fragments of horizontal stabilizer. Having performed a coup de grace, the fucky wolf spiked at us. We only had time for a short burst, and a new flash appeared in the nose of the enemy. It could have been the flames from his guns. The fuck wolf flashed past us in a steep dive, and I was beginning to turn around behind him when Styx reported triumphantly. Bob, he's dived right into the water. All right, now let's go. The pursuit has been longer than we thought, and our fuel was dangerously low. Satisfied with our victory, we raced southwest toward home, hoping for the old faithful Mossy. A few kilometers ahead, we could see the line of the west coast of Jutland, and a few seconds later, we passed near a small town on the shore. Suddenly, it was as if all hell had broken loose, and the sky was filled with red lines of traces from an enemy anti-aircraft battery we hadn't noticed. I was dodging from side to side, but the anti-aircraft gunners were firing accurately. We could hear the thumps and clangs as shells and shrapnel hit our mossy that had become a game. It seemed an eternity until we were out of their range and far enough over the sea. The engines were not damaged, but one or more of our fuel tanks appeared to have been punctured. Sticks did some quick calculations and reported that at our present speed we would run out of gasoline when we were about 170 km from the English coast. It was not a pleasant thought, but we had to try to do something about it. To maximize range, I turned off one engine. When it stood up and the propeller froze, we could see that the tips of its metal blades were bent. My goodness sticks, we must have snagged the ground when we got caught in his vortex while pursuing the fucky wolf. Ten centimeters lower, and it would have been all over for us. At severely reduced speed, we flew our damaged mossy towards England. About 160 km from our shore, when the fuel gauge showed almost nothing, we slowly climbed to 900 meters and transmitted on the emergency frequency signal Mayday. At this altitude, this was about the maximum reach of our radio, so we were relieved to hear a faint English voice in reply, asking us to continue transmitting and to indicate as accurately as possible our position. A few minutes later, the same voice reported that the Royal Air Force rescue boats were out in our direction. Despite this encouragement, the sea looked terribly huge, and we had absolutely no confidence that we had pinpointed our location. Chances of us being found seemed really slim. These grim thoughts flashed through my mind as Styx nudged me and pointed to two specks on the horizon. Vessel, I altered my course a few degrees to turn toward them, and as we drew nearer I saw that they were trawlers that were slowly sailing a southerly course, one behind the other. 
If they were so close to England during the day, they must have been ours, considering that an encounter with a small rescue boat in the expanse of the North Sea would be nothing more than a fluke. We decided that our salvation lay in these trawlers. A final check of the flow meter showed that there was no fuel left. I told Styx that I would be boarding and ordered him to drop the overhead escape hatch and tighten his tie-down straps. Making a smooth turn, I planned to a point about 800 meters ahead of the lead vessel. There was only a slight swell on the sea. Planning lower and lower, suddenly felt an onslaught of air current. This was the top hatch, flying off and disappearing behind. At a height of 15 meters, I warned Styx to hold on. Tensing, I landed the mossy on the water as gently as possible, as much as possible at 200 kmha. There was a resounding bang as we were thrown forward. I covered my face and head with one hand, and with the other hand I pulled the steering wheel sharply toward my stomach, trying to keep our airplane from burying its nose in the water. There were several more thumps with a ripping noise as our wooden bird slid across the hard surface of the sea and, slowing rapidly, came to a stop. It was quiet all around except for the splashing of water against the broken fuselage and the breathing of two frightened men. We climbed out through the top hatch and sat on the cockpit, looking around. The nose of the airplane was underwater, but we ourselves were still virtually dry. Mossy had broken in half just behind the wings and the tail section was slowly drifting away. At 800 meters a boat was launched from one of the trawlers. Seeing that our part of the airplane with the engines was sinking into the water, I suggested to Styx that we each get into our own lifeboat. I inflated mine, hoping to get into it without getting too wet. At that very moment a small wave rocked our island, and we both plunged into the sea. My life jacket was already inflated, so I swam a couple of meters in the surprisingly warm water to my rubber dinghy which was floating nearby. Getting into it was harder than I thought it would be, and I regretted never having done dinghy training in the past. After a long struggle I ended up in the dinghy as it turned out, on the wrong end, but I was too exhausted to care. Looking back at Styx, I saw him dangling in the water a few meters away from me. Apparently he had lost his dinghy. Paddling diligently with my arms, I swam over to him and dragged him over to me, laying him across my legs. He looked pretty green, having had enough of the North Sea. The two of us heavily overloaded the dinghy, which was designed for one, and, exhausted, drifted about waiting patiently for the boat to come up to us. Strong hands lifted us into the boat and wrapped us in blankets. Finally, we boarded the trawler where we were greeted by a middle-aged Royal Navy lieutenant. In each hand he held a glass filled to the brim with rum. Gratefully, I accepted it, gulped it down and immediately regretted having done so. The rum was so strong that I almost fell overboard into the water again. Styx barely had time to art. Thank you before he started to vomit and rush to the In gratitude to our rescuers, we gave them almost everything we had on us. They took royal care of us, but we had to convince them that they should dilute their alcoholic beverages a little with water. For some time, the two trawlers, or to be more accurate, Navy minesweepers, shot the remains of our plane with their 20 mm elecons to make them sink. However, our proud Mossy, although it took many hits, was in no hurry to go to its grave. As we sailed off in the direction of England, she was still bobbing unruly on the waves. We had not been on board the trawler long. The flotilla commander approached it in a fast torpedo boat and took us away so that the minesweepers could continue their work. We said goodbye to the rescuers and at a speed of 30 knots for VAF travelled to Grimsby which was 110 kilometres away. About halfway we were met by a boat from the Royal Air Force Rescue Service and we changed boats again. The boat's crew loaned us civilian clothes and we were examined by a doctor as we made our way into the harbour. In the gloom we moored at Grimsby where we were met by the commander of the nearby bomber air station. He brought us to his airfield and treated us to a spread, but we were very tired and were in no mood to celebrate. We soon slipped away to go to bed. For some time I could not sleep, foreseeing the trouble that awaited us on our return to Mapgevel in the morning. An encounter with an angry Embry would probably be far more dreadful than a fight with the Huns. After breakfast the next day, we rode the Oxford back to Benson in our borrowed civilian clothes. Our uniforms were still damp. At Mangewell Park, I went directly to Meg's office and asked that she tell the group commander that we were back. Through the open door, I heard her inform Embry that the Wanderers were back, but in very strange clothes, and asked if he wanted to see us. I heard him say that he would only see me when I was properly dressed in my uniform. 
The tone of his voice made me wince. As I changed in my room, I started to shake. Added to my fear of meeting Embry was my reaction to the six-hour flight, the fight, the water landing, and the lucky rescue. Stakes tried to reassure me that everything would be okay, but I doubted it. Meg escorted me into the boss's office, a long, high-ceilinged room. The team commander sat at the far end at his desk, along with David Atchley. Already this long walk to the desk alone was demoralizing. All the while, the commander's unblinking steel-gray eyes drilled me. His first question took me by surprise. What's your progress? I expected an immediate explosion. I gave him a brief account of our adventures, and he congratulated me on my success, then very calmly told me everything he thought about my flying without his special permission. He never once raised his voice, and probably because of this his words had an even more devastating effect. I respected this man more than anyone I'd had ever met before, and that made the ordeal even harder. The tension from the combat sortie, and the feeling that we had let him down had brought me to the brink of an emotional breakdown. Seeing my predicament, David gave me a friendly smile to encourage me. It didn't help. With great difficulty, I held back tears as I mumbled a pathetic apology. After finishing the smackdown, Embry said, It's all forgotten now. Have a beer with me at lunch. I said a hasty goodbye and headed for the vast grounds of Manuel Park. There I did not hesitate to cry alone. That evening our troubles were forgotten, Rufus sticks. Jacko and I went to Clemmy's to celebrate our safe return. Our favourite pub was crowded, mostly Royal Air Force guys, a little diluted by infantry and locals. A lot of beer was drunk and many loud phrases were spoken, but the sense of camaraderie among us was such as is rarely found in peacetime. The war, with all its horrors, can also evoke something good in a person. It engendered a warm sense of camaraderie like that which permeated everything at Clemmy's that evening. At one point Styx found himself in a corner, surrounded by a crowd of eager listeners. Looking at this group from time to time, I caught suspicious glances. I suspected that something suspicious was going on there, so I walked across the smoke-filled room and came up just in time to hear what Styx was telling me. You wouldn't believe it. But when I tried to climb into his dinghy, he pushed me away and even threatened to pistol-whip me in the joints. The expression on his face was so serious that the audience didn't know whether to believe him or not. When I put the toe of my boot on his ass, he whimpered. Bob, I was just trying to get them to buy me some more beer. What the others thought as we headed back to the bar together, I don't know. Maybe they thought I was being rude or that Styx was crazy. We were amused by the whole thing, though. At the end of May, a general meeting was held at group headquarters regarding the approaching D-Day. The magnitude of the Allied tasks and the complexity of the planning astounded me. We were informed that under no circumstances would any of us fly over enemy territory until the decisive D-Day. It was necessary to eliminate any possibility that anyone with knowledge of the impending operation would be captured and blabbed out through inadvertence or duress. Other restrictions were also imposed. Our private mail, incoming and outgoing, was strictly censored, and vacations were severely restricted. Such restrictions, burdensome at the time, were necessary, and they had an effect. Until the last moment, the Germans could only speculate as to what the Allies' intentions were. When I woke in my room at Mapduel Park in the early hours of June 6, 1944, it was still dark. The continuous muffled roar of heavily loaded airplanes could be heard. It must have been this noise that woke me up. Jumping out of bed, I ran down the broad staircase of the old mansion and out the front door onto the lawn. In the moonlit sky with the clouds running fast, I could vaguely make out the dark silhouettes of many large airplanes heading south. They were British and American transport planes with paratroopers aboard, the vanguard of the largest military undertaking in history, the landing in Europe. Although it was warm to stand on the dew-covered grass, my body was covered with goosebumps. I was overwhelmed with pride that I was a small cog in this great machine of the Allied offensive. Everyone, from the group commander to the very last person on our staff, planned to participate in combat sorties on D-Day. The commander on his personal mosquito, under the name of Wing Commander Smith, intended to fly a night assault sortie. David Atchley, whose arm was in a cast after an accident in North Africa, a few months earlier, convinced me that he should participate in such a sortie as my navigator. Had we been hit because of David's plastered arm, our chances of jumping out on parachutes would have been practically slugging it out. But I admired this man's bravery so much 
that I couldn't refuse him despite the great risk. I found that almost the entire command of the second air group was going to participate in the Jerry strike. This again testified to the remarkable fighting spirit of the group. There were few, if any, Allied air formations that could match it. David and I took off late in the afternoon from Le Cham in a Mosquito 613 squadron. In addition to the usual cannon and machine gun armament, we carried four 227 TG bombs with 11 second deceleration fuses. Our mission during the night was to patrol over the highways and railroads 80 chem in front of the bridgehead captured by the Allies. In company with many other Mossies of our group, we hoped to interrupt the flow of German reinforcements and their entry into the front line battle on the banks of the Normandy coast. As we flew at low altitude over the English Channel, it became apparent that David was not too familiar with our G navigation equipment. It was a clear, moonlit night, allowing us to navigate the ground as if on a map, but flying over the channel was polio by reckoning. But it wasn't too difficult. German anti-aircraft artillery in the Cherbourg and Channel Islands area, firing at some high-flying aircraft, helped us determine our exit point to the French coast near Saint-Malo. We continued flying eastward to Granville and on to Argentan, looking on the ground for signs of moving columns of German troops. The discipline of the enemy night convoys was excellent. Any natural cover was used to hide parked vehicles, and at the sound of approaching aircraft, the dim convoy lights went out. For some time, we searched the ground for an object to fire upon, burning with impatience to attack the enemy on this historic day. Detecting a camouflaged transport from an airplane flying at speed at low altitude is difficult enough during the day. At night, however, it's a real problem. The other town of Widovid, my attention was drawn to flashes on one of the roads. Someone had already stormed a German column. Okay, we'll finish their job now. We spotted a few vehicles, went down. I pressed the fire button hard with my thumb, and a stream of 20 shells and bullets rained down on the column of vehicles scattered in disarray below us. When we were a few dozen meters out of dive, David dropped our bombs to cause further devastation. As we gained altitude steeply, we saw many explosions and fires, but because of the smoke we could not see exactly what damage had been done. Our patrol time was almost up. We headed home, satisfied with our contribution to the group's efforts that night. In the way back, near Granville, we saw a plane approaching from the front. It was only a few hundred meters away. I turned sharply to the left to avoid a collision, and it appeared to me to be a Messerschmitt 410 DA. Before he disappeared from my sight, I began to turn quickly after him. Soon seeing its silhouette, I realized it was a mosquito. We were disappointed that it was not a Hun, but also happy that we had recognized a friendly aircraft in time. Again, enemy anti-aircraft artillery fire allowed us to avoid the hot spots and find a safe place to cross the French coast. Three hours after takeoff, we returned to La Cham, and David began apologizing for his poor navigation. Who cared? The flight was quite successful. We later learned that the Mossy we had mistaken for Messerschmitts at first glance belonged to the commander of the air station at Lasham. When we returned, he had just started a patrol. The time and place matched. At the last moment, he also saw us and at first mistook us for the enemy too. Fortunately, neither of us pressed the fire button. I certainly did not realize at the time that the active part of my air war was rapidly coming to a close. Before I was shot down and taken prisoner with Don Walsh, I made only two more flights in June, both with Robbie. The first was a night attack sortie, and the second was a daytime raid over Denmark. On the night sortie, we strafed cars near Granville and bombed a bridge over a river. I think I was totally unsuited for the role of bomber pilot because I didn't hit the bridge. During the afternoon raid, we were accompanied by a second mosquito, flown by Mike Herrick and his Polish navigator. Mike had asked me many times in the past to let him fly with me so that he could share my confidence in the value of such raids. As this was the first flight of this type for Mike, his route was shorter and easier than mine. Over the coast of Jutland, we split up. Mike headed north to the airfields near Alborg, while Robbie and I continued east toward Copenhagen. We didn't spot any enemy planes, but we did bombard three army vehicles and a railroad train with good results. Poor old Mike's luck ran out. He and his navigator fell victim to the guns of a Focke Wolf 190, which I learned many years later was piloted by the same pilot who eventually shot me down, Robert Spreckles. The loss of this brave New Zealander and his navigator was a personal blow to me. Michael and I had been friends for many years, and I felt some personal responsibility for his loss. 
My belief in the value of such raids influenced him, and he decided to take part in the sortie. I decided that in the future I would always fly out alone on such raids. About the day after this raid, I was called in to see the group commander. When I walked in, he jumped up from behind his desk and shook my hand, informing me that I had been awarded a second buckle to my Distinguished Combat Service Order. Wonderful news to me. But what about Styx, my navigator, who had already received the Distinguished Flying Combat Service Cross with Buckle and the Distinguished Flying Medal while flying with me? I felt he deserved credit for our successes more than I did, since he had risked his life with me for so long. When I asked Embry if Styx would be honoured as well, he said he was sorry, but there was no award for him. Perhaps there would be an award later. Months later, when withering away from the Germans as an unwanted guest, I learned that Styx did receive the well-deserved Distinguished Combat Service Order. In order that I might celebrate my new award, I was given a leave of absence for a few days and spent it with Joan in Leicester. Then, for the last time until the end of the war, May 1945, I saw my family. When, at the conclusion of my leave, I kissed my wife and children goodbye before returning to Manjwell Park, I had no premonitions of trouble. I now return to the beginning of my story, where I told how the war ended for Don Walsh, my Australian navigator, and for me. Don and I sat depressed in the barracks of a German radar station, wondering what the future held for us. Soon two Luftwaffe officers arrived to take us by car to the nearby airfield at Esperger. Any thoughts of escape we had 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 to be put aside when we saw that there was also an armed soldier in the car, who was alert at all times. At the airfield we were searched, and the Luftwaffe Oberst briefly interrogated us. Then we were taken to the cells in the brig. Being alone, I fully realised the gravity of our situation. What worried me most was that Joan would not know for some time that I was alive. We were to be reported missing with all the terrible uncertainty that flowed from those words. It was like a bad dream, but I knew I was awake. Remembering the recent German atrocity of shooting 50 prisoners of war from Stalag Luft, I, I, I wondered if we would ever see our homes again. Perhaps Hitler, in Germany's final hours, would destroy us all in his mad rage. This uncertainty visited us often for the rest of the war. After a restless night, we were awakened and, after being given black sausage for breakfast, told to get ready for departure. Under guard by two German non-commissioned officers armed with Schemeisse rifles, we were taken by car to the station where we boarded a train for Frankfurt am Main, where the Luftwaffe's main centre for interrogating Allied air crews was located. Frequent stops due to air raids made the long and slow trip even more difficult. These stops annoyed our guards, who seemed to hold us personally responsible for all the consequences of the bombing of Germany. Civilians and soldiers shouted insults at us. We were air bandits and were threatened with violence. At night, several drunken German soldiers tried to break into our compartment because the other cars were full. Our guards told them that soldiers could not sit with us. We were English pigs. The soldiers, losing control of themselves, tried to enter by force. One of them took out a bayonet. For the first time in my life, I felt my knees knocking and had to clutch them with my hands to prevent anyone from seeing my car to sit and wait with suspense to be lynched by the frenzied mob or to leap out of the carriage door and be shot in the back by the guards. Then a young soldier in a black S uniform burst into the compartment and shouted some command. The effect was surprising. The soldiers immediately dispersed, to the displeasure of our guards. The officer sat down next to us, looking down on us with contempt, as if to say, OK, Englishman, you should be grateful to me for saving your worthless hides. But whatever he thought, we were grateful for his intervention. We spent a day and a night on the train, then were taken to a camp behind barbed wire on the outskirts of Frankfurt and Main, an interrogation centre. We were again stripped, searched and locked in separate small cells. Each had a wooden bed with a straw mattress infested with vermin. We spent approximately two weeks in this centre, most of the time in solitary confinement. Every third or fourth day we were taken to Hauptmann Cox for interrogation. This intelligent, very polite intelligence officer had extensive information about my service career. Apparently, the Germans drew much useful information from British newspapers and radio broadcasts, as well as from embassy reports in neutral countries such as Ireland, Portugal and Spain. It was in Frankfurt that I first saw the official announcement of my award of a second buckle to the Odrias for Distinguished Combat Service. Coach brought to my cell a clipping from an English newspaper and said, 
Wing Commander, here is something that you will want to keep. Your country holds you in high esteem. Smiling, he walked out and left me alone with my thoughts. We were also visited by one of Goring's adjutants, Hauptmann Kaupisch. He was pleasant to talk to and spoke good English. He was obviously trying to siphon information out of us. He told us that he would soon continue sorties against England in a Junkers 88 bomber and asked that we inform him how effective the British air defence system was. What was the best way to avoid our night fighters and anti-aircraft artillery? What he expected to hear from us, I do not know. But he seemed surprised when I advised him to continue to remain an adjutant to Goering. During one of the interrogations, a young Luftwaffe officer entered the room and coach introduced him, Wing Commandeur. This is the pilot who shot you down, Lieutenant Spreckles. You were his 45th victim. It could have been a ruse to make me talkative. Since the German pilot and I didn't speak each other's language, anything we could say had to be translated by Coke, who was alert. The Jerry pilot wore around his neck the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, so one of the highest German awards for bravery. He was about 173 centimetres, tall, and had beautiful dark brown hair. Spreckles seemed friendly, and, after shaking my hand, expressed his satisfaction that neither of us had been wounded. From our very embarrassed conversation I deduced that Spreckles had lost his parents in one of the Royal Air Force's massive raids on Hamburg, but he immediately emphasised that he had no ill will toward me personally. This is war, he said, if this was the man who shot us down. And I later received confirmation of this. His chivalrous behaviour in battle was all the more commendable. He could easily have killed us, both out of revenge for his terrible loss. Coach sent for tea and dry cookies, which came in handy. Don and I received only a slice of black bread lightly buttered with margarine three times a day, and a plate of watery soup for lunch. The sudden lack of nourishment after the relatively good food to which I had been accustomed in England, war team notwithstanding, would have made me blacken if I had been sent too quickly to my prison bunk. Over tea, Spreckles and I continued our cautious conversation through coach. When asked what I thought of the future course of the war, I replied that I considered the German position hopeless. The Allies were now firmly entrenched in Europe, and the Red Army was already at the borders of the Reach. It should not have taken long for these huge armies, with their overwhelming air support, to shake hands. I do not know whether these remarks made an impression on my interlocutors or not. I could not help admiring Spreckles, who seemed so frank and friendly and in many ways resembled many of my friends in the Royal Air Force. Before he left, he said that he was soon going to the front in Normandy and would be fighting against our Spitfires. Apparently he had not met them in combat and asked me what my opinion of their performance was. I preferred to feign ignorance. As we said goodbye, we shook hands, I wished him good luck and promised to treat him to Scotch whiskey when we won the war. At the time I could not have guessed that one day we would write to each other as old friends instead of enemies. During the last interrogation, Coach took me for a walk around the small area of the camp while assessing the general situation in the world. He speculated about the threat of Bolshevism and said that Germany had started a crusade to save the world from the Red Hordes. He even suggested that in this last stage of the war, Germany and England should settle their differences and join forces to save the Western world. The blame for the war, he argued, lay with the Jews of the world, and our two countries should never have fought each other. Goebbels had said the same thing many times before, so I was not impressed. I have my doubts as to whether this very intelligent man actually believed all of this. Just before I returned to my solitary confinement cell, he looked at me and said, You are blonde, like a German, and probably have Nordic blood. Would you like to fly again, but this time with Germany, against Russia? I held back from laughing with great difficulty. Noticing this, he added, But on reflection, I think that if we gave you an airplane, you would try to get home on it. How right he was! Soon Don and I, along with other powers, began the long train journey to Stalig Luft Arena in Sagan, near Breslau, near the Polish border. The details of prison life in the camp are so well shown in many excellent books that I will reduce this chapter of my life to a few paragraphs. During the ten months of captivity I had to fight boredom, like thousands of others, by keeping physically and mentally fit. Escape in this last stage of the war was severely punished. The attempt was hardly worth the risk. The enemy demonstrated that he was willing to commit cold-blooded murder to stop such an endeavour. The shooting of fifty prisoners of war in March 1944 was a crime committed by the Gestapo and the SS. 
the Luftwaffe did not condone them, looking at them with as much disgust as we do. The prisoners from Stalagluft TI were moved twice during my entire stay in Germany. The first time was in January 1945, when the camp was threatened with capture by Russian units advancing on Breslau. In very cold weather, we were first marched on foot and then put into cattle trucks. The Americans were sent to Luckenwalde, near Berlin, and the rest to the old merchant marine internment camp, Milag Nord, near Bre. The foot march and travelling in a crowded van, devoid of any kind of comfort, was the most unpleasant experience I encountered. We suffered no fatal casualties, but many of us were frostbitten. The second foot march was much more leisurely. It took place in the warm weather of April 1945. The Germans wanted to move us to Denmark where, if the front line stabilised, they could use us to make a deal with the Allies. By this time, most of the Nazis among the guards had left us to go into hiding or fight to the end. Those who remained were older men who, just like us, wanted to see the end of this unequal struggle sooner. So the prisoners themselves set the pace of the march, which never exceeded five kilometres a day. Eventually, on May 2 near Lübeck, we found ourselves in the advance lane of the British 11th Armoured Division and began the return journey to our freedom. I flew back to England via Brussels. The headquarters of the 2nd Air Group was now in the Belgian capital, and I spent a merry 24 hours with my old comrades before continuing home. I arrived at headquarters wearing the same jacket I had worn when I was shot down plus khaki American army pants and brown American boots, an officer looking somewhat scruffy. Air Vice Marshal Embry greeted me like a prodigal son. He clapped me on the back and said, Bob, you're old. You stink. How about a bath? No doubt he was right. For weeks I slept in these very clothes, unable to even wash myself properly. While I was enjoying a wonderful bath, washing off the remnants of camp stench, a new uniform was prepared for me. Group Captain David actually kindly lent me a car and driver, and I made a trip with my friends to the amusements of the city. It soon became clear that the lack of alcohol in the camp had reduced my drinking ability, at least temporarily. Briam embarrassed himself by falling off very early in the party. The next day I flew back to England on the Mosquito. It was strange to be flying again after such a long break, especially as a hungover passenger. But the desire to be in the air was still there. A few hours later, I knocked on the door of my wife's parents' house in Leicester, where a wonderful reunion with Joan and my two little boys awaited me. It was spoiled within minutes of my arrival by a new knock on the door. Local reporters wanted to hear my story and film my return. I'm afraid, remembering the embarrassment some of the newspaper articles had caused me during the interrogations, I wasn't very polite. I asked the reporters to leave. They did not want to understand my condition. After all, there was general interest in my story, and the as a result, I forcefully pushed them out of the house in annoyance. In retrospect, I realized that these were two drastic measures. They were only trying to do their job, but camp life made me, like many others, embittered and insecure. Living in close contact with thousands of people in conditions of deprivation and degradation could magnify the most minor negative traits to monumental proportions. On the slightest occasion, an angry exchange of swear words could easily erupt, or sometimes a fight could break out. During the last phase of the war, we would catch BBC reports of strikes in war material factories and industrial unrest on our secret radio, which added further to our anger for POWs. Strikes meant a lengthening of the war and loneliness for us and our families. The psychological effects of my days in the camp made me, for a time, a difficult person to live with. It was many years before I fully regained my confidence and was able to give my family a normal, happy life. I will always be grateful to Joan for her amazing patience during this difficult time. Any other wife would have left me. After the end of the war, I was given permanent service and my future seemed assured. However, the Royal Air Force was changing rapidly and thousands of flying and ground staff were returning to civilian life. For many of us who had been in continuous combat, peacetime service seemed dull and empty. In March 1946, in a distraught mood, I decided to leave the service and begin work with the colonial police in Tanganyika. But even before starting my new job, being on leave at the time before being laid off, I realized that I had made a mistake. Air Vice Marshal Embry, now in charge of training in the Royal Air Force, helped me get reinstated. From then until May 1952, my path lay through a variety of posts in headquarters and flying units. Most of these were concerned with the development of night fighters, 
or as they are now called, all-weather fighters. Styx and Jacko also stayed in the Royal Air Force, but both were older than me and had little future as flying personnel, so moved into the ground services. Styx became a superb fighter interceptor ground control operator. Jacko an air traffic control specialist, and with his confident actions inspired pilots when, regardless of the weather, he guided their landings without error. These two fine men are still my friends. Ross, a Canadian with whom I shared my early successes using airborne radar at night, returned to Canada at the outbreak of war, and unfortunately I was unable to trace his subsequent journey. Don Walsh returned to civilian life in Australia a disillusioned man. While he was in captivity, his wife had left him. My efforts to learn of Spreckel's fate immediately after the war failed, because the surviving Luftwaffe records were in disarray, and news of him later reached me in a very interesting way. To me, post-war England was a dismal place to live. The people who had fought so long and bravely had fallen into apathy. They expected things to go back to normal without much effort on their part. No one appeared ready for hard work, and everyone continuously demanded higher wages. It seemed to me that only hard work and sacrifice could get England back on its feet. Even the defeated Germans on their devastated soil were demonstrating how the scars left by war could be erased through discipline and hard work. Joan and I often discussed these issues and became increasingly worried about our children's future. Our family grew larger with the birth of our third son. We decided that the solution was to emigrate to Australia or Canada. After much discussion, I decided to join the Royal Canadian Air Force. At that time, they were looking for experienced pilots, capable of flying in all weather conditions, who could help create a new air defence command. With many regrets, and against the advice of most of my friends who thought I was giving up an excellent future in the Royal Air Force, I left the service again and accepted the Canadians' offer. In May 1952, on the ship Empress of Scotland, we sailed for Canada to a new life. My fighter aviation experience was of some value, and I received several assignments to staff and flying positions in eastern Canada. Joan and the children were happy. We were living well and the problem of educating the children was largely solved. In 1954, I was transferred to North Bay, 300 kilometres or so north of Toronto, to head a training and combat unit of Canadian Kiev 100 all-weather jet fighters. One day I received a letter from the German consul in Bath, England. It went first to the Air Ministry in London, then to the Canadian Air Force Air Defence Command headquarters in Ottawa and finally to North Bay. The consul wrote that he had worked with Herr Spreckels in Hamburg after the war and that Spreckels, whose address was enclosed, would like to make contact with me. This was wonderful news. From then on, Robert Spreckels and I corresponded regularly. After the details he gave me, there was no doubt that he was the pilot who had shot down Don and me on June 25, 1944. Our correspondence made it possible to find out many interesting things. It was Spreckels who shot down Mike Herrick on that fateful sortie when we flew together to Denmark, and when Mike died. Spreckels spoke highly of the brave New Zealander and his Polish navigator, who fought bravely before dying. The German also told us that the Focke Wall 190 that Styx and I fought, and ended up in the North Sea, was from his squadron at Eyalborg in northern Denmark. So during May and June 1944, our paths nearly converged several times. Robert Spreckels went into the shipping business after the war. Despite the tension and hatred in the world, my personal but former enemy is now part of my circle of very close friends. This experience shows that aviators from different countries can find common ground. As I write the final pages of this book now, my family and I are sailing on the motor ship Italia from Montreal to Le Havre. The Canadian Air Force Air Defence Command has assigned me to the headquarters of the Supreme Command of Allied Forces in Europe in Paris. More importantly for me, this ship with its friendly crew and passengers from various countries brings me back to Europe and gives me a chance to meet Spreckles again. I owe him a whiskey and soda.